so much, uh, Kristin and Ellie, for uh, the invitation to partake in this panel. And also um, thanks to um, Valérie Giroux, as uh, was mentioned earlier, for all the organization that went um, behind this, um, and Crea and Crea in general. Um, OK, so um, as Kristin said, I'm going to be talking about epistemic injustice, intersectionality, and autism. Um, and um, just a little bit of context with the uh, themes of the conference and the questions that uh, we're describing the panel. Um, so uh, one of them was, how do oppression and structural inequality shape individuals' perceptions of themselves and others, as well as public discourses? And another was, given the persistent and damaging effects that oppression has on individuals, uh, which tools are available for addressing it? Um, and so Today, uh, I think that uh, the themes that I'll be and questions that I'll be um, talking about in my uh, presentation really, I think, are ways to um, address um, um, these questions. So, um, in terms of uh, contextualizing um, the specific topic, um, you may or may not know that um, diagnostic criteria for autism were originally formulated based on autistic boys. Um, and autistic traits uh, actually um, typically manifest differently in girls. And so the ratio of diagnosed um, autistic men to diagnosed um, autistic women across generations is around uh, four to one or higher. So for every four autistic um, men diagnosed, you only have one uh, autistic woman diagnosed. So what that means is that many autistic women go through life undiagnosed. Now, um, autism, uh, as you may know, is a different way of processing the world, uh, whether we're talking about social interactions or environmental stimuli. Um, and so very often, um, being autistic in a neurotypical world is going to lead to a sense of confusion or inadequacy or mismatch. And that's true um, even if you know you are autistic, uh, but it's really exacerbated and amplified um, if you uh, do not know um, the source of that confusion or sense of inadequacy or mismatch. Um, and in fact, um, there's a high uh, rate of anxiety and depression and unemployment amongst um, autistics, whether they're diagnosed or not. Um, so uh, that's just to um, situate a little bit the context behind um, autism, but more uh, specifically to connect it to the theme of epistemic injustice, um, I want to suggest that the male bias in diagnosing autism creates hermeneutical injustice for undiagnosed autistic women. Um, specifically, a lack of diagnosis leaves autistic women in the dark by obscuring from understanding a part of their experience. And here I quote uh, Fricker, which it is strongly in their interest to understand. Um, so uh, in her um, book, uh, Fricker talks about hermeneutical breakthrough. And what I want to say is that undiagnosed autistic women uh, need but are deprived of a hermeneutical breakthrough when it comes to um, uh, autism. So um, in her book, uh, Fricker gives this example of women who had been experiencing postpartum depression, but without knowing that it was uh, postpartum depression. And then they learned about it and they recognized themselves in it immediately. So she quotes this woman um, who says, in that one 45 minute period, I realized that what I'd been blaming myself for and what my husband had blamed me for wasn't my personal deficiency. It was a combination of physiological things and a real societal thing, isolation. That realization was one of those moments that makes you a feminist forever. So this is Wendy Sainford cited in Fricker. And um, really, the thesis I want to defend today is that receiving an autism diagnosis constitutes a major hermeneutical breakthrough for previously undiagnosed autistic women. Um, and that making this hermeneutical breakthrough possible requires adopting an intersectional approach to autism. So here's where the notion of intersectionality comes in. Uh, and more specifically, that means that we need to attend to the gender biases that pervade both the social and medical spheres when it comes to autism. And that this is a matter not just of epistemic justice, but also of social justice. So the outline for today to cover all of this, I'm going to start with some methodological remarks and then uh, turn to uh, defining autism and show how hermeneutical breakthroughs can affect uh, autistic women's social, economic, and uh, mental well being. And um, nonetheless, that hermeneutical injustice can preempt those um, important hermeneutical breakthroughs, and that in order to address that, we need an intersectional approach to autism. <laughs> 
So um, to start with the methodological remarks, um, there's this very famous slogan that um, you're probably aware of, uh, nothing about us without us. This is um, both in the disability movement and the neurodiversity movement more specifically as well. Um, and the idea, obviously, as the slogan says <laughs> quite plainly, is that um, basically uh, policies, but also theories um, about disabled and in this particular case, uh, autistic people uh, should not be formulated without um, the leadership and um, input and um, involvement of uh, autistic people. So um, I kind of feel compelled having said this in a talk on uh, hermeneutical breakthroughs and um, epistemic justice um, to uh, mention that I'll be addressing this topic from a first personal uh, perspective as an autistic woman, um, a scholar and philosopher, um, that obviously, uh, like any, any other member of a social group, I am not making any claim of, of being a spokesperson on behalf of the group. And this actually uh, is also because of reasons of intersectionality. Um, including gender identification. I'll be focusing on, on diagnosed autistic women, but of course um, we can also think about uh, trans folks and non-binary folks. Um, and so, um, and not to mention race class and physical uh, disability and, and, and the like. And so um, really it's, uh, you know, autistic people are a very um, internally diverse heterogeneous group. So that's important to mention. Um, in terms of language, this is very important. Um, I'm going to be using identity first language. Um, that sounds like autistic person. Um, that kind of language views autism as a positive source of identity, and it's a kind of language that's uh, chosen very intentionally by the neurodiversity movement uh, and um, autistic self-advocates, including myself. Um, and that's by contrast with um, person first language about autism, uh, which sounds like person with autism or person who has autism, um, which views autism as a problem or a disease. So with these mythological remarks in place, um, let's go on to defining autism. Um, and autism uh, can be either a, a medical diagnosis or um, a social identity. And in fact, both are important for hermeneutical breakthroughs, which is what I want to talk about today, um, simply because, as you can see, um, uh, receiving a, a diagnosis is what's going to yield uh, improved self-understanding. So right there you have um, the medical aspect and uh, the, 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 the social aspect. Um, and I do want to point out though that recognizing the significance of receiving a diagnosis without, um, it's still possible to uh, um, do so without thereby reducing autism to its medical or neurodevelopmental uh, dimension. And conversely, because access to uh, hermeneutical breakthroughs, uh, which is a matter of epistemic justice, and to certain types of support or services for autistics, which is a matter of uh, social justice, um, are both going to require a diagnosis, it's important not to reduce autism to its social or environmental dimension. So I really want to uh, make room for both, even if, of course, um, as we'll see, I'll also uh, uh, adopt a critical uh, stance toward the medical model. Um, okay, so uh, still to start with this uh, mo uh, medical model, um, autism as a medical diagnosis as defined in DSM-5, uh, this is a paraphrase, of course, but it's really the two criteria that they uh, identify. So. Um, it's a spectrum uh, that's characterized by greatly varying degrees and forms of um, number one, difficulties in social interactions and communication. So that might, for example, be things like making eye contact, uh, small talk, navigating conversations. Um, and number two, um, so-called restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior. So for example, um, having uh, fixed routines or rules, um, hyper-focus on specific interests, uh, hypo or hypersensitivity to environmental stimuli, um, like light, sounds, smells, textures, or temperatures, uh, or stems, so twirling uh, objects or um, yourself or flapping. Um, I do want to note, like I said, this is a paraphrase. If you do go online um, or if you um, look at the definition as it's in the DSM, or if you go online and look up medical definitions of autism, uh, the terminology is going to be uh, very negative, right? So it's a, so uh, the official diagnosis actually is ASD, and that stands for uh, autism spectrum disorders in the plural. Um, and uh, so just the word disorder and um, you know deficit, like all these things, are very um, 
there's a lot of uh, negative language around autism in the medical world. Um, I uh, will point out that uh, I uh, use the word difficulties here for the first uh, criterion. And you should note, of course, it's very deliberate that the word difficulties leaves open the source of these difficulties, right? So it doesn't mean that it's inherent in the autistic person. Uh, rather, very often it will be uh, because of the neurotypical world uh, in which they live. So there is a mismatch between the person and their environment. Um, and of course, um, also, for example, things that uh, have to do with um, uh, basically what we'll call here later on uh, neuronormative norms, um, which um, basically sort of arbitrarily uh, draw the line between, you know, what's acceptable or not. And so, like, for example, you know, um, just to use a, uh, one example, it's, you know, quite uh, frequent to see people when they're tired to like rub their face or something like that. Um, and that's not like viewed as like something particularly negative or, or uh, uncommon, uh, but you know, like for example, um, if autistic people use their hands or their fingers in a way that's like not um, neurotypically uh, viewed as uh, normal, uh, then that's going to count as it's going to disqualify them as like weird socially and things like that. So it's just to say that like, obviously there's a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, social construction of, of, um, of these things are going on in the background there. So they're not natural kinds. Um, that's important to keep in mind. Um, okay. So uh, to go on, um, still talking about autism as a medical diagnosis, um, there will be, according to DSM, uh, three levels based on the level of support that's required. So uh, level one, which used to be called uh, Asperger's syndrome, um, you'll require some support, for example, quiet workspace and clearly stated work expectations and guidelines. Uh, level two is more substantial support, um, for example, therapy for verbal or social skills. And level three is very substantial support, uh, for example, continuous assistance for daily needs and tasks, such as eating or getting dressed. Um, sometimes you'll hear these different levels referred to as uh, low versus high functioning uh, autism. I think, and a lot of autistic self-advocates think this as well, uh, we should drop um, those labels. Um, they are obviously a very um, a telling of an ableist hierarchy, uh, not to mention the sort of um, uh, uh, you know, the, the whole history um, that's behind um, that, that it's a distinction that's historically served um, to uh, justify uh, really um, harmful uh, wrongs uh, like eugenics and forced sterilization and things like that. And another reason why that's not helpful uh, um, uh, or, or why we shouldn't use these labels precisely is that it's not helpful really to um, to, to uh, differentiate uh, uh, along those lines. And one reason is that then uh, people who are viewed as high functioning, uh, their difficulties are also uh, really um, minimized, um, sometimes making it more difficult for them to get uh, the uh, um, adaptive measures um, that they might need. So um, it's just uh, sort of, yeah, minimi minimizing the difficulties that uh, even level one so-called uh, autistics will still face. Um, okay, but what I wanna say though, um, perhaps a bit more concretely is that the autism spectrum includes individuals who simultaneously meet the two broad diagnostic criteria while displaying vastly different levels of functioning, quote unquote, um, in everyday life, depending on their respective abilities and limitations. So you'll have some autistic people that may be highly intelligent and others are um, intellectually disabled. Some may be nonverbal while others are verbally proficient and some may be able to live independently while others require assistance with everyday living. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on uh, so-called level one autistic women. Um, just for the sake of uh, concision and uh, brevity, I'm gonna just talk about autistic women. But again, I wanna make very clear that uh, they're not the only kinds of autistic women that matter. It's just um, also the um, level or group that I'm more um, uh, more adequately uh, positioned to talk about. Um, so uh, those are women who are verbally and cognitively proficient and who are able to live independently and care for themselves while simultaneously meeting the two diagnostic criteria of autism. Okay, so um, this, uh, it should be uh, pointed out, this definition of autism um, is uh, connected to this idea of autism as a neuroatypical profile. So neuroatypical profiles are characterized by neurodevelopmental variations, and that simply means neurological variations that arise early in childhood brain development and that manifest themselves in various domains such as um, 
language and communication, learning, social interactions, and motor functions. And uh, neurotypical profiles include uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, but also um, attention deficit or hyperactivity disorder, um, ADHD, dyslexia, intellectual disability, and cerebral palsy. Um, and non-autistic people uh, who may be neurotypical or uh, neuroatypical are referred to as allistic uh, people. So that's just for the terminology. Now let's turn to um, defining autism this time as a social identity. And here um, it's important to talk about neurodiversity. So uh, neurodiversity as a movement, as I've mentioned before, um, views autism as a positive source of identity as opposed to a disorder. And really the name of the neurodiversity movement comes from the recognition of what neurodiversity is, what it empirically tracks in the world, uh, which is the natural range of variation in neurodevelopmental profiles, which can be broadly categorized as either neurotypical or neuroatypical. Um, and so the idea is that neurodiversity um, views autism as a neurocognitive difference as opposed to a neurocognitive deficit. Um, and you might illustrate this is a, um, an analogy I borrow from, uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, from a, a, a podcast called uh, Les Neurodivertissantes, uh, which just uh, started recently here um, in uh, Quebec. Um, and it, on this podcast, I use this analogy of um, basically if you view um, uh you know, uh, operating systems uh, of computers. Um, so uh, PC uh, might be um, a more common type of computer uh, running an operating system like Windows and uh, Macs, um, a less uh, common type of computer running an operating system like uh, OS X. Um, but you would not say that uh, your Mac computer running OS X is Windows deficient. That just doesn't make sense. Like it's just a different kind of, um, uh, basically, it, that is deficient in, in Windows or something like it's just it's just a different kind of operating system. So same thing with autism. We need to drop all these things about deficits and disorders and whatever, because that's just not um, an adequate way, really, of capturing the situation. Um, and so really what that does, um, if you start looking at differences as basically these natural, naturally occurring ranges of variations in uh, neurodevelopmental profiles, then um, really uh, the neurodiversity movement by emphasizing uh, neurodiversity exposes also neuronormativity. So this is a notion that I've defined with two colleagues uh, from Gamle Crochet and Pierre Poirier in an article that came out earlier this year. And neuronormativity, as we define it there, is the prevalent neurotypical set of assumptions, norms, and practices that construes neurotypicality as the sole acceptable or superior mode of cognition, and that stigmatizes attitudes, behaviors, or actions that reflect neurotypical modes of cognition as deviant or inferior. Neuronormative assumptions, norms, and practices uphold standards regarding, for example, what is neurotypically considered appropriate eye contact, facial expressions, prosody, conversational flow, Processing speed and responsiveness, all of which can be difficult for artistic individuals to understand, sense, or apply due to neurological differences. So, um, what uh, recognizing this exposing neuronormativity does uh, is going to have to effect uh, for uh, the neurodiversity movement, essentially, in effect, is going to be empowering autistics as a community through their shared, positively valued social identity, and is going to do that first by invalidating the stigmatizing and subordinating language and representations that pervade the medical and social spheres. Um, all these notions of disorder, deficit, dysfunction, epidemic risk, and uh, phrases like it's affected by autism or suffer from autism, all these things. Um, and by um, putting the perspectives and experiences of autistic front and center, uh, meaning uh, turning to first personal narratives on autism by uh, autistics rather than uh, third personal narratives on autism by medical professionals or uh, clinicians um, who don't know what it's like to be autistic, but will still claim um, that they can uh, by making claims like, um, autistics uh, don't have uh, emotions or don't have any uh, social motivation or these sorts of things, um, which are known to be false. So um, now uh, going back to our outline, I've defined autism. So I'm going to turn to how hermeneutical breakthroughs um, affect um, autistic women's social, economic, and mental well-being. And um, so let's start with this notion of hermeneutical breakthrough. Um, and 
I think it's interesting that to see that how we can adapt Fricker's uh, passage in her book uh, to the case of autistic women. So obviously I'm like really paraphrasing almost uh, verbatim uh, the, the, the flow of her quote here. So uh, through the process of receiving a diagnosis, autistic women often realize that they have been, that what they have been blaming themselves for and what others, uh, for example, family members, friends, employers, or coworkers have blamed them for is not their personal deficiency. It's a combination of neurodevelopmental differences and a real societal thing, neuronormativity, and that kind of realization often turns one into an autistic self-advocate. Um, and Fricker talks about um, hermeneutical breakthroughs as being a kind of revelation and a life-changing flash of enlightenment, um, which is going to bring uh, a, a greatly improved sense of uh, self-understanding. So, um, why is that that receiving a diagnosis uh, allows you to understand yourself better? Um, well, simply because it's really not the same at all to experience and understand yourself as this random human with some idiosyncratic experience that seems to differ in important respects from that of most others around you. And then to experience yourself and understand yourself as an autistic person whose experience is explained by neurocognitive differences that are actually shared by so many others. Um, and so receiving an autism diagnosis and understanding yourself as autistic fundamentally changes your point of view on yourself as a person, on your life as a whole, and on your daily experience. Because you now understand yourself as neuroatypical and autistic, and the difficulties you might have faced and continue to face as resulting not from personal deficiencies, weakness of the will, or character flaws, but from the fact that you live in a neurotypical world made by and for neurotypicals and structured by neuronormativity. So um, let's see now how uh, receiving an autism diagnosis is a matter of uh, social justice. Well, the idea here is that access to relevant support and services provide crucial resources um, like workplace accommodation, um, help in finding employment, coaching for everyday challenges, access to medical or psychological professionals um, who specialize in aut autism. Um, and that's important because autistics typically face difficulties in securing, sorry, securing or retaining employment um, in navigating daily life and in obtaining the right type of medical or psychological diagnosis. Um, it's not rare uh, for autistics in general, for autistic women in particular, uh, to receive partial or uh, misdiagnoses uh, before um, they get their uh, autism diagnosis, if they ever do. Um, and uh, those diagnoses uh, or mis partial or misdiagnoses include anxiety, depression, uh, bipolar, ADHD, OCD, anorexia, and GI or um, sleep issues. Um, and so really what I wanna draw um, attention to here is that male biases in diagnosing autism often prevent women from accessing an autism diagnosis and hence from being able to have the kind of hermeneutical breakthrough that can have a profound impact on one's self-understanding and on one's social, economic, and mental well-being. So um, now that I've explained um, how hermeneutical breakthroughs can affect um, women's social, economic, and mental well-being, I want to show how hermeneutical injustice can preempt a hermeneutical breakthroughs. Um, so here, um, the idea, like I said, is that hermeneutical injustice is an obstacle to hermeneutical breakthroughs. More precisely, uh, male bias in diagnosing autism creates hermeneutical injustice for undiagnosed autistic women. Um, like I was saying earlier, a lack of diagnosis leaves autistic women in the dark by obscuring from understanding a part of their experience, which is strongly in their interest to understand. Um, and this male bias prevents autistic women from having uh, this hermeneutical breakthrough. So it basically perpetuates um, a, a hermeneutical injustice because the typical understanding of autism accounts only for the male phenotype of autism and leaves out female phenotypes. So um, here I think it's important to expand on Frinker's notion of hermeneutical breakthrough. She really just mentions it once. She illustrates it very powerfully, I think, with that quote from Wendy Sanford, and she says it's a revelation, a life-changing flight of enlightenment. But I think we can um, construct a more systematic account. And so that's kind of what I'm doing here. And um, the idea is that hermeneutical breakthroughs for me are going to um, involve uh, at least three related elements. Um, a hermeneutical tool, which is um, something like a word, a phrase, a concept, or any other hermeneutical resource that's used to describe or interpret a particular situation or experience. So you might think of sexual harassment, postpartum depression, or autism. These are all hermeneutical tools. Then you have hermeneutical representativeness. Um, the way that a concept is understood and applied to track its extension in the world. Um, 
meaning how the extension of the concept is empirically identified and generally, if sometimes tacitly, viewed or represented. So for example, um, if you view a philosopher as someone who's a straight white male practicing Anglo-American analytic philosophy, you're going to be ruling out um, basically anybody else who practices philosophy who uh, has a different um, sexual orientation, uh, race, uh, gender or gender identification, um, and practices other um, traditions of uh, philosophy. Uh, and likewise, if you view a, a, an autistic person as a little boy or a, a savant, uh, you're going to be ruling out little girls and, uh, and, and um, adult women. Um, so who are not uh, savant. So um, that's for uh, hermeneutical representativeness. And then finally, there's this notion, I think in hermeneutical breakthroughs, that's very important here, obviously, which is this notion of improved self-understanding. And the idea here is that you're gonna gain a greater insight, clarity, and understanding about well, yourself, your life, and your experience through a hermeneutical breakthrough. So um, the idea is that a hermeneutical breakthrough requires not only a concept, but also a representative conception of this concept. So the more representative the typical representation of a given concept is, like philosopher or autism, the more likely it is that relevant agents will see the possibility of applying the concept to themselves to more precisely characterize and understand their particular situation. Uh, for example, a uh, subject or career of interest or a different experience in a neurotypical world, uh, which may define part of their identity um, as a philosopher or an autistic person. Uh, even if those are obviously very different identities, uh, one is a social group and one is not, but still. Um, so uh, conversely, um, non-representative uh, representations of particular hermeneutical tools or resources, uh, for example, viewing autism as a male issue, uh, prevent the relevant agents, uh, for example, an undiagnosed autistic woman, from recognizing themselves in these representations, and hence from connecting the label or interpretive resource provided by the hermeneutical tool to themselves and their sense of identity. So um, hermeneutical non-representativeness um, is going to prevent the kind of improved self-understanding that characterizes hermeneutical breakthroughs. And um, the stakes in failing to reach a hermeneutical breakthrough in the case of autism are a matter of both epistemic hermeneutical justice, because one's experience is obscured from understanding because of inadequate concepts or representations, and um, social justice, because this lack of understanding affects one's social, economic, and mental well-being. So I think it's important to look closely at what explains hermeneutical non-representativeness in the case of autism. And so that brings us to our last um, point here um, in the outline of the talk for today, um, which is this idea that remedying hermeneutical injustice requires an intersectional approach to autism, and that specifically means attending to the gender biases that pervade both the social and medical spheres when it comes to autism. Okay, so um, what I want to claim here is that non-representativeness, uh, the non-representativeness of the typical representation of autism is due to um, two things. Uh, first, the overlooked intersection of gender and neuronormativity in the social sphere. And uh, second, the neglected intersection of gender and neuroatypicality in the medical sphere. And these uh, two kinds of oversights um, reinforce certain uh, expectations that perpetuate the gendered asymmetry in diagnosing autism. So um, in the social sphere, um, there are neuronormative and gendered expectations about how to behave and what social interaction should look like. Um, as we said before, neuronormativity includes the assumption that people should socialize, the norm that making eye contact and appropriate facial expressions shows receptivity and the practice of making small talk and so on. Um, there's also uh, gender norms and expectations. So women, as we know, um, uh, women and girls um, are expected, among many other things, um, to be quiet, compliant, or, or even passive, non-confrontational, agreeable, and mothering. And um, all of that is going to put considerable pressure on autistic girls to blend in, uh, to gain parental or teacher approval, social acceptance, a sense of belonging, and to avoid social sanctions like mockery or ostracism. So now um, imagine an autistic girl growing up in this neuronormative gendered environment. 
While she appreciates the company and friendship of her peers, she also thoroughly enjoys solitude, playing or reading quietly by herself, and making eye contact or small talk make her feel utterly uncomfortable. But her parents, teachers, classmates, friends, and not to mention all sorts of media around her, uh, constantly reinforce the neuronormative and gendered expectations that she should behave differently, uh, spend more time with her peers, engage in various social activities, talk with others, and do so nicely, politely, and without putting up any resistance. So um, many autistic girls, um, this is very well uh, documented now, um, learn consciously or unconsciously uh, through observation and imitation to adapt and to camouflage. That means um, they're gonna force themselves to be social, smile and make eye contact and small talk and generally act like their neurotypical peers. So camouflaging, which is also known as masking, requires both hiding and performing. Um, it's hiding one's discomfort stems, uh, social anxiety and other difficulties that arise in the context of neurotypical interactions and communication. But it's also acting as much as possible in a neurotypical way by engaging and talking with others, um, socializing, joining groups and conversations, making jokes or sharing anecdotes. Um, so as a result of masking, um, level, one, level one autistic girls and women are generally able to function relatively well in a neurotypical environment. So for example, they're able to learn in mainstream classrooms and to hold a job, and they don't typically require much special support to do so. Having said that, that doesn't mean that masking um, is uh, without its costs. It is not without its costs. Uh, masking requires a tremendous amount of effort and energy and often takes a significant physical, mental, and emotional toll, sometimes leaning, leading to autistic meltdowns, which is hyperreactivity to environmental stimuli, autistic shutdowns, which is hyporeactivity to environmental stimuli, and autistic burnout. Now, because level one autistic girls and women um, who, as I mentioned before, are verbally and cognitively proficient, tend to mask by displaying apparent social and communication skills um, and are thereby often able to pass as neurotypical, they're less likely to be referred for an autism diagnosis or to receive an autism diagnosis when they're uh, referred. So that brings me to talk about the gender expectations in the medical sphere, now that we've gone over those in the social sphere. In the medical sphere, gendered expectations about what autism um, there are gender expectations about what autism looks like or how it presents. So um, the medical sphere produces and maintains gendered biases both structurally in the diagnostic resources that are institutionalized as so-called um, gold standard measures, and um, also interactionally in clinical interviews that seek to apply them to interpret the behaviors and responses of interviewees and thereby determine whether an autism diagnosis is appropriate. And um, as um, uh, Another uh, author uh, put it, you know, um, diagnosis is in the in the eye of the beholder. So the idea here is that a clinician's interpretations will be biased if they're based on male bias representations and expectations that fail to account for female autistic phenotypes. Um, now. Um, to talk about these uh, uh, female autistic phenotypes, uh, masking is a good example of a coping strategy developed as a result of difficulties in both diagnostic areas. Uh, for example, making eye contact or small talk helps to mask difficulties in social interaction and communication, whereas controlling stims or putting up with crowded, loud, or bright environments helps to mask patterns of restricted and repetitive behavior, including sensory issues. Um, and uh, an autistic girl's difficulties can also be concealed uh, by friendships that take the form of mothering, where the allistic, so non-autistic friend, acts as a protective mother-like figure for the autistic girl, thereby shielding her um, and making her difficulties less readily observable. So, um, whereas autistic boys um, might externalize difficulties in social interaction and communication through uh, disruptive or aggressive behavior. Autistic girls tend to internalize these difficulties often in the form of anxiety um, or depression. So that's another uh, difference with the female uh, autistic phenotype. Um, moreover, girls are expected to be reserved. So their quiet or withdrawn attitude will more easily be mistaken for shyness or introversion instead of being interpreted as autistic traits. And women uh, also tend to have fewer uh, so-called restricted and repetitive behaviors. And when they do, they tend to be more subtle. Um, so for example, whereas boys might show a special uh, 
interest in unusual things like train schedules or license plates, um, girls' special interests uh, in, for example, novels or animals will tend to be more aligned with uh, those of their holistic peers, although they will also often be more intense and limited uh, than those of their um, holistic peers. So um, really the idea here is that we end up uh, in a vicious circle, right? So we have a male bias in medical uh, diagnosis and um, uh, social representations of uh, autism um, that leads to an underdiagnosing of autistic women. And because there are very few autistic women who become diagnosed, it maintains a male bias in, in inaccurate representations and understandings of autism in both the medical and social sphere and so on. And then we're back in a circle again. Um, so uh, to conclude, um, the male bias in the typical understanding and representation of autism in both the social and medical spheres um, leads to um, what I've called hermeneutical non-representativeness. Um, as a result, undiagnosed autistic women are prevented from having the kind of hermeneutical breakthrough that brings not only greater self-understanding, but also greater social, economic, and mental well-being. Um, that means that um, hermeneutical non-representativeness undermines significant elements of both epistemic and social justice for undiagnosed autistic women. And so we need an intersectional approach to autism that accounts for uh, female autistic phenotypes. Among other things, this is what I focused on in this talk, again, because that's what I'm most adequately positioned to talk about, um, but that's obviously not the only way that an intersectional approach to autism needs to be um, uh, uh, formulated, right? So I've focused here on uh, undiagnosed autistic women, uh, but again, important to talk about um, how it intersects um, for uh, gender identification and um, uh, physical disability and race and class and all these things. Um, so I will stop um, the screen uh, sharing now so that uh, we can turn to Q&A. Thank you.